All right, let's talk about chapter 16, which deals with conjugated pi, system, pi systems and what are known as pericyclic reactions. So really interesting reactions in this chapter. But before we get into some reactions, let's talk about um, conjugated pi systems. And if you've wondered what a conjugated pi system is, I can introduce you to the subject very quickly. Conjugated, a conjugated pi system means you alternate double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, like that. That's a conjugated system. So if you think about something like benzene, okay, if I have benzene, that's a conjugated system, right? Because the double and single bonds alternate back and forth, double, single, double, single. If you were to have this molecule here, this is 1,4-cyclohexadiene. This is not a conjugated system, right? Because you have a double bond, but then you have two single bonds and another double bond like that. So conjugated, again, means the double and single bonds alternate. Well, with that in mind, let's take a look at the first official slide here. It says that there are several classes of dienes that you need to know. Three to be exact. You need to know um, what are accumulated dienes, conjugated dienes, and isolated dienes. A Accumulated dienes, sometimes we call these allenes, so allenes, okay? You'll see that sometimes in some books, maybe. Anyhow, an allene or accumulated diene is when the pi bonds are adjacent to each other. And this little dot that's shown here, that actually represents a carbon atom. So if you were to draw, you know, the condensed structure of this, you'd have double bond to carbon, then another double bond coming off like this, CH, and then a methyl group like that. So that's what the dot represents. It represents that quaternary carbon in there. Um, let's see. The next one is a conjugated diene, and that's the class that we're going to be most interested in in this chapter. And remember, I told you that in a conjugated system, it alternates double, single, double, single, so on and so forth. And then isolated, when I have an isolated um, diene, that's when I have the pi bonds are, that are separated by more than one single bond. And so you can see here in this example, it's, they're separated by two by two uh, single bonds, one, two, like that. So that's isolated. So you need to be fully aware of accumulated, conjugated, and isolated. But again, as I told you, conjugated will largely be the focus of what we talk about in this chapter. Conjugated dienes, a little bit more. Um, what makes conjugated dienes so special and why we spend so much time talking about them is because they are the only type of diene that has a continuous system of overlapping p orbitals, right? You know that when you have an sp2 hybridized carbon, that you have three sp2 orbitals, and then you have the unhybridized p orbital. And so in each one of these here, okay, you see all of the p orbitals in gross and dirty detail. So in the cumulated system, right, this is the cumulated system, and I can pencil it in here. You have a double bond, and then you have another double bond. Well, if you think about this carbon, right here, that carbon in the middle, which is this one right here, those, there's going to be two p orbitals there, and they're not going to be able to be right on top of each other. And so we have this 90 degree angle between the two p orbitals here on that carbon in the middle of the cumulated diene. In the conjugated diene, however, and I'll pencil in what they're trying to show you here, they're showing you that you have this molecule, which is 1,3-butadiene, like that. Well, you know that you have a p orbital on each one of these, right? You have a p orbital here, you have a p orbital here, you have another one here, you have another one here, right? I'll erase that because it looks ugly. But they're showing all of them in this diagram right here. And what's important is that you understand is that they overlap. You see how it's you see how there's red in between here, and you see how there's blue in between here? That means that those p orbitals overlap, and we talked about that when we discussed. Um, benzene way back in organic chemistry one, and that forms a conduit so that the electrons can move between all of these orbitals like that, okay? And that's going to impart some uh, stability to that diene that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then the next one is the isolated, the isolated diene, and what they're showing here is this molecule, so like this, so this would be a one, two, three, one, four um, pentadiene. Anyhow, and you can see that there's overlap between, the, uh, obviously overlap of the p orbitals in the pi bonds themselves, but there's no overlap in between the two, the two, um, the t between the, the p orbitals of the two pi bonds is what I was trying to say. Okay, there we go. 
So again, we're going to spend a lot of our time in this class or in this uh, chapter focusing on conjugated um, dienes. And again, they have this continuously overlapping system of p orbitals. All right. Let's move on from there and talk a little bit more. It says here this chapter, again, focuses on conjugated dienes and the special properties and reactivity associated with them. This is something that we'll look at in even more detail later on in this class in another chapter is a conjugated, this is what we call an enone, and you might guess where that name comes from. En comes from an alkene, an alkene, and there's an alkene right here. And then own comes from a ketone, and there's a ketone right here. But again, we have a conjugated system of double bonds here, right? And so we have, you know, we have a p orbital here, we have another one here, we have another one here, and we have another one here. And so they do all continuously overlap. And then again, that's going to impart some unique reactivity to conjugated, to conjugated enones. And again, we'll spend a lot of time talking about those later on in the class. Um, we can also have heteroatoms involved in a conjugated system. Here, it looks like we have, you know, ar aromaticity here because we have the three pi bonds alternating like that. But if you look here, we skip and then we have another. We have another pi bond, which is all part of this conjugated system. So if I said you know, circle the entire conjugated system here. I would circle all of this because all four of those pi bonds that I have inside that big green circle are conjugated. Now, if I look at this pi bond over here, this one is isolated. It's by itself. It's not conjugated to anything else in there, right? If you go to the closest bonds away from it, you have one, two, and then the next, the next double bond, you know? Do the same thing here, one, two, and then the next double bond. And so um, that is isolated, all right? There we go. It says here for each of the following compounds, identify, identify whether the carbon carbon pi system is cumulated, conjugated, or isolated. So the first one is cis uh, uh, aconitic acid. Um, plays a role in the citric acid cycle. Probably heard of cis aconitase if you've ever studied the citric acid cycle and biochemistry. Anyhow, could anybody tell me? What do I have here in this molecule? Do I have conjugated, cumulated, or, or isolated? You can either type in the chat. I'll even put, put answer, put answer here. Okay. Well, I got one person say conjugated. I, well, I got a few people say conjugated and some people saying isolated. And you're both correct, right? There's both. Okay. We have both conjugated and isolated. If we highlight these ones here in yellow, we have double, single, double, single, double, right? That is a, that's a conjugated system, right? Because the double and single bonds are alternating. But over here, we have this one lowly, we have this one lowly isolated double bond over here. So isolated like that. Okay, the next one, the same thing applies, right? We have both. We have this isolated double bond or double bond over here. So we'll put isolated, isolated for this guy, okay, isolated, no, isolated, there we go. And then over here we have, you know, double, single, double. So there we have a, we have a conjugated system, uh, conjugated, there we go. What about the last one? Any ideas with the last one? Okay, I see conjugated and isolated. I see both, and you're, and you're both correct, right? We have a conjugated system right here. So conjugated, we'll just put uh, conjugated like that. And then over here, right? Oops, let me highlight that. We have an isolated, an isolated system right there. And you're like, Mr. Dion, can you make the whole quiz about this? Well, might have a question or two but not the whole quiz, so, because we need to get into some reactions, all right? So let's talk about how you would prepare a conjugated diene. There's a couple of ways that are shown here. Nothing really new about this. Um, we've looked at E2 reactions many times. If you take a secondary alkyl halide, like is shown here, this is, you know, this is secondary, and these are both secondary, right? If you take a secondary alkyl halide and you treat it with a strong base, strong nucleophile, but a hindered base like potassium p butoxide, you're going to get an E2 reaction, and you could practice drawing the curved arrows for this. We could draw our butoxide anion and say, well, it's going to pull off, it's going to pull off 
one of these protons off the methyl like this. So pull my curved arrow going to the wrong place to my hydrogen. I make my double bond. I have my leaving group leave like that. And then, so this is an E2. This is an E2 reaction. Okay. Um, oops, turn off my doorbell. Anyhow, so that's an E2 reaction. And um, the next one, it would just be a double E2 reaction. So you would pull off, you know, this proton and you pull off this proton and you could draw the mechanism for that if you want to do that. But that's the way that we would make a conjugated diene like that. All right. Um, what else? It says here conjugated dienes. What about bond lengths? OK, so we're going to talk about bond lengths just for a quick second here. It says the single bonds that are part of a conjugated pi system are actually shorter than typical uh, single bonds. You can see that we're investigating this single bond right here and this single bond right there. There's, they have different bond lengths. And what's the difference, really? Well, you can explain it a couple of different ways, but the main way that I would use to explain it in this class is based on the hybridization of the carbons involved in that bond. Right, and it says it right here. This is due, at least in part, you know, to some degree, it's due to the hybridization of those carbons. So the two carbons involved in the conjugated diene in that single bond right here, they're both sp2 hybridized. Whereas the two carbons in ethane are obviously both sp3 hybridized. And this is taking you way back to organic chemistry one when we talked about hybridization and the size of orbitals. And we know that a p orbital. Right, a p orbital is bigger than an s orbital. Okay, well, with that in mind, if we know that a p orbital is bigger than an s orbital, if we look at the difference between an sp3 and an sp2 orbital, an sp3 orbital has more p character and less s character. It's only a quarter, 25% s character. And if we look at an sp2 orbital, it's actually a third s. And so an sp2 orbital is smaller, right? So it says the more s character, the more s character you have, the shorter the orbitals or the smaller the orbitals, whatever you want to say, and the shorter the sigma bonds will be. So that's the rationale for why the carbon-carbon single bond in a conjugated diene is actually shorter than that of a um, uh, the single bond uh, between two sp3 hybridized carbons. Well, let's switch gears a second here again and talk a little bit more about conjugated dienes and about their inherent stability that I alluded to earlier when we when we looked at the overlap of those p orbitals you might have noticed that I made a comment I said well that imparts some stability well how much stability does it impart let's take a look at this experiment so if you're wondering oh boy what's going on in this graph it's not meant to be anything complicated at all it's showing you here that if you take this molecule okay this molecule here is one butene okay and if you take two molecules of one butene, that's what this two represents, so two molecules of one butene, and you hydrogenate the two of them, right, and you measure the enthalpy, okay, the, the heat release, the constant pressure, for that hydrogenation of those two moles of one butene, you release 254 kilojoules of energy. I'm like, okay, that's cool, Mr. Dion, thanks, okay. What are you doing here? You're hydrogenating two pi bonds, right? That's what you're doing. So if you take this molecule here, which is 1,3-butadiene, right? We have 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1, 3, both of those have double bonds, 1,3-butadiene. If we take that molecule and hydrogenate it, you would think, okay, well, I'm doing the same dang thing. All I'm doing is I'm hydrogenating the two double bonds. Okay. All right. So I'm hydrogenating the two double bonds. Well, shouldn't it? release the same amount of energy. Actually, it releases less energy. It releases 15 kilojoules less. And what does that tell you? That tells you that 1,3-butadiene is more stable than 1-butene, or the two molecules of 1-butene, by this amount, by 15 kilojoules. Okay, so it's 15 kilojoules more stable per mole. Okay, so what's the take-home message from this slide? Is that a conjugated diene Okay, this experiment shows why conjugated dienes are more stable than isolated alkenes, you know, if we hydrogenate the same number of double bonds. All right, well, with that in mind, I'm going to get you to take a look at this question, which is, 
rank the following compounds in order of increasing stability. I'll give you a second to look at that. Okay, so could anybody tell me which one of these would be the most stable, A, B, C, or D? Which one of these do you think would be the most stable? Somebody said D. Yeah, a couple people said D. Yeah, I would go with D as being the most stable because you can see that the all the double bonds are fully conjugated, right? One, two, three, like that. So that's definitely going to be the most stable. If you look at the other ones, there's nothing in A, B, or C. There's no arrangement where we have three double bonds that are conjugated, right? We do have conjugation um, in B, right? We have conjugation here, and we have conjugation in C as well, okay? But um, we don't have three bonds conjugated. If we look at A, everything, so I should write, put um, E in here like this. Which one of these would be the least stable? Does anybody have an idea which one would be the least stable? Yeah, the answer should be A, right? Because both double bonds are isolated. So we could put that here, both, both carbon, carbon bonds are isolated. Okay, so this one's gonna be the least stable. So we'll put A down here. So now it becomes a battle between B and C. And this goes all the way back to chapter seven. I wanna see if anybody can figure out which one would be more stable. Would it be B or would it be C? Yeah, I see some people saying that it's B. And I agree with you. It should be B. That's gonna be the more stable of those two. So we'll put B and then we'll put C like this, okay? And the reason why B is going to be more stable is because even though B and C both have conjugated systems of just two, um, two pi bonds, it's, how did you figure that out? I'll just ask my students. How did you, what was your rationale based off of what? I get some people that have the answer, but nobody nobody has a rationale. Not based on symmetry, no. It's not based on isolation. No, there's no sp hybridized carbons in any of these structures. The isolated double bond is less sigma bonds away from the others. No. It's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with the stability, right? It has to do with stability, but why? why? Okay. Yes, yes, of course, B is going to be more stable. That's the answer to the question, right? We have the answer right here. But why is it more stable? Okay, can anybody answer me why? A lot of people said B, but I'm not getting a good reason. The double bond is between three rings because they're more center of the molecule. The inner pi bond is shielded. Wow, I'm getting some, I'm getting a lot of answers here. Okay, it's to do with substitution, right? It's to do, it's got nothing to do with resonance. It's based on substitution. So this is something we talked about in our alkenes chapter, right? When we talked about the stability of alkenes, right? We go from ethylene to a mono substituted alkene to a di substituted alkene to a tri-substituted alkene, to a tetra-substituted alkene. 
like that. And the more substitution you have on an alkene, the more stable it is, okay? Less stable. So it's to do with, the answer is substitution. If you look at this double bond here, I'll start with this one. This one is tri-substituted. This one is tetra-substituted. This one is di-substituted. And this one is tri-substituted. So since overall, there's more substitution on the double bonds in B, they're going to be, it's going to be a more stable conjugated system. All right, there we go. So going back to chapter seven, following our way through some old concepts. Okay, well, let's move on from there and talk a little bit more about conjugated dienes. It says here that generally sigma bonds are free to freely rotate. The two most stable um, rotational conformations for butadiene are S cis and S trans. You guys totally know what trans and cis are in an alkene, right? If you have two groups on the same side like this, oops, that's too big. Okay. So that would be cis. And then if I have two groups, if I have two groups on opposite sides like this, that's trans. Well, the S in S cis and S trans, that S stands for sigma. Sigma. And so this right here is a, this is a sigma bond, right? And this is a sigma bond, sigma. Okay. And there's free rotation around that sigma bond. Okay. You can rotate that and you can rotate this. So when the dihedral angle between the two double bonds is zero degrees, we call that um, S cis because they're, they're blocking each other. And when the dihedral angle between the two double bonds is 180 degrees, we call that S trans. All right. So again, if you were to take your eyeball, if you were to take your eyeball and look down here, right, you'd see that these two groups are eclipsing each other. So that would be zero degree dihedral angle. And if you were to do the same exercise here, you'd see that these two groups are 180 degrees apart. Okay, so the dihedral angle is 180 degrees. All right, if you need me to show you a model, let me go here. Okay, so here is a model of the two butene. So this is two butene here. You can see the two double bonds in it here. So I have CH2, methine, methine, methylene like that. So there's the two double bonds. This is the S cis conformation. If I take that and I rotate it, if I rotate it like this, I get the S trans conformation. It's not trans like an alkene. Okay, It's not cis like an alkene, but that's S cis and S trans. Now you can probably already guess. Now I know you all read the book a few times before coming to class today, but you can guess probably that this confirmation, the S cis, is going to be higher in energy because the dihedral angle between the two double bonds is zero. They block each other out. In the S trans confirmation, right, you can see that the bond angle is 180 degrees. They're 180 degrees apart. If you look with your eyeball, down that axis like that. So S trans and S cis. All right. Okay, so the P orbitals are still going to be conjugated in both of those, in both of those, um, Rotomers. So those are called, we call them rotomers. They're just conformers that differ by rotation. So it's just a fancy name for conformers that differ by that interchange, I guess, um, between, uh, by rotation. <clears throat> Anyhow, so <coughs> as I just alluded to, the S trans is lower in energy, and that's because it has less steric hindrance. And what's that barrier of rotation? It's going to be that 15 kilojoules per mole. Why? Because when you rotate this bond, right, when you rotate that bond, here the dihedral angle is zero degrees. Well, I guess it's labeled down here. Here where it's 90 degrees, and I'm not going to try to draw that. I could have shown you, but when they're 90 degrees, the overlap, so overlap of P orbitals, orbitals is completely broken, completely broken, okay? There's no overlap um, between the p orbitals in the middle here, between these two carbons, all right? 
and then we go down to the to the S trans, and you can see that the S trans is more stable than the S cis by 12 kilojoules per mole. All right, that's enough about that. Um, it says the highest energy conformer is not conjugated. So here's the, this is the conformer that's at a nine, this is a 90 degree angle here. And you can see that there's no overlap of the P orbitals right there. All right, well, let's move on from there. And I'm gonna skip the section on molecular orbital theory. It doesn't mean it's not important because we spoke about it in organic chemistry one, but I'm gonna skate over this right now and get into the details of section 16.4. So I'm not gonna ask you any specific questions about MO theory. We're gonna get right here and talk about something that's familiar to all of us, which is electrophilic addition. And this goes all the way back to, says here, Markovnikov addition, section 9.3. I thought it was before that, but anyhow. It says here, recall, recall that, um, HX addition to a carbon-carbon double bond proceeds with Markovnikov addition. So you do your proton transfer, you make the most stable carbocation, which in this case is a tertiary carbocation, and then you get your nucleophilic attack. Well, what's interesting is if you take a conjugated diene, and I told you we were going to spend a lot of time today talking about conjugated dienes. If you take a conjugated diene and you do the same thing, you treat it with HBr, you actually get a mixture of products, okay? And we have names for these two products. If you were to number these carbons, one, two, three, four, like this, you added the hydrogen here, and this is carbon one, and you added the bromine here on carbon two. We call this the one, two adduct, or the one, two product sometimes. And then if we label it here, so we have the hydrogen here, one, two, three, four, we call this the one, four adduct. Okay, so the one, four and the one three, and we're gonna look at the mechanism as to why this happens. So first, what happens is you protonate and you get a special kind of carbocation, right? It's not your run of the mill carbocation, it's an allylic carbocation, which is resonance stabilized, right? It's a resonance stabilized carbocation. So you might even look at this carbocation here and say, well, that's primary, that's not stable. That's not true, it's primary allylic, and so it is quite stable based on resonance. And so the nucleophile, your bromide, is going to be able to attack. It can either attack here at the where, at this carbocation, or it could attack it could attack at this carbocation right there. And you can probably figure out that's how you get those two products that you showed me on the last slide. Now, again, don't fall into the trap of saying, well, this is a primary carbocation that could never happen. Remember, that's primary allylic. It can totally happen, and that is why the hydrogen will not get added to this carbon because then you would form a primary carbocation that's not resonance stabilized and we're never going to see that. So as I explained, once you produce your allylic carbocation, which is shown here in these square brackets, which indicate what? Resonance. Here I have the nucleophile attacking and then we call this the product of the 1-2 addition. And then this is the product of the 1,4 addition. Now, I will ask you to identify some products of 1,4 addition and 1,2 addition. And so there's lots of good problems in the book that show you um, uh, how to draw these mechanisms and how to draw the products. But before we get into that, I just want to mention that any kind of electrophile can result in, or the addition of other electrophiles, I should say, like bromine, for example, um, can add to a conjugated diene to give you both one, two, and one, four addition product. Well, let's get some practice here. That's enough rambling on by me. And let's, um, let's try a practice problem here. We'll start with 16.6b, which says, predict the products for each of the following reactions and propose a mechanism that explains the formation of each product. Let me just show you something here that I don't see my students doing this a lot, but every once in a while, I'll see somebody try to pull a chestnut like this where they'll say, okay, well, I'm going to get my, um, I'm going to get my protonation in the first step, and they'll draw it like this, okay, and then they'll do something like this, okay, that really means that they were too lazy to just do this, to just draw the Lewis structure of HCl, so always make sure that you have a bond that you can draw a curve arrow to, so we're going to start by adding the proton to this carbon right here, okay, we're going to have our leaving group leave, and let's draw the carbocation that would be formed. So I'm going to draw this carefully. There we go. 
we have bond here, we have this. Now we added the hydrogen right here. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the carbocation is going to be there. Now, what's so special about that carbocation? That is a resonance stabilized carbocation. It is an allylic carbocation, and we could draw the resonance structure for that carbocation. So let's try doing that. We're going to move the pi bond over here. And then what we would have is the other resonance structure, which is going to look something like this. So we'll have our double bond over here. All right, like that. And we'll have our positive charge here. So both of them are tertiary allylic carbocations. Now what can happen is that we can get our we can get our nucleophile attacking either one of those carbocations. Now I'm not going to redraw both of them. I'm just going to leave it like this. And in fact, maybe I'll delete this arrow just so it doesn't confuse anybody. I'll delete the resonance arrow. Okay. And so now my chloride, my chloride, and I'm not going to draw the lone pairs. I'm just going to draw the arrow, the curved arrow from the negative charge. I can get nucleophilic attack here, and I can get nucleophilic attack there. What would I get? Let's draw the products. So I'm going to draw short arrows here because I'm going to need a lot of space. And I would end up with this product. This. Okay. Now this is a stereocenter. Okay. And that nucleophilic attack could occur from either side. And so this will be this will be racemic. And then I'm going to get a nucleophilic attack here. And I will end up with this where I have my chlorine over here like this. My double bond, and there we have it. So I'll end up with these two products. All right, so those two products. Now, is there anything else that I could get in this reaction? And the answer is yes. Okay, what if I added my HCl to this bond over here? Could I do that? Absolutely, I could. So, what I'm going to do is, in the interest of space, as I am running out of it here. I am going to try to move this all a little bit, okay, like this, and then I will move it up like this, and then I'm going to have to do an abridged version of the next mechanism. So let's erase this and that, and erase this, and now we're going to add HCl to the other side, okay? So now we're going to add our HCl to the other side of the molecule. So if I protonate right here like this i'm going to end up with you're going to have to excuse me here because i'm going to need a lot of space if you're like do i have to be able to do all this yes okay so i protonate it i end up forming a carbocation here which is resonance stabilized i can draw the resonance structure like this so let's draw the resonance structure we can draw the resonance arrow like that okay there we go. And then let's draw. It's hard to see when I'm writing on the bottom of the iPad. And there we go. I'll make sure I don't miss anything. There we go. And we end up with a tertiary carbocation like that. Now, both of these can be attacked by the nucleophile, the chloride. Chloride and the chloride. And here we go. So I'm going to get nucleophilic attack here, and I'm going to get nucleophilic attack there, and I'm going to get two more products. And so let's draw these products out. So I'm going to get this. Again, I'm going to have to draw it a little small here. You should get the idea. So I get this product, and I also get this product. This. So with my chlorine over here like that. Okay, so I get a total of, let me see if I can move this a little bit. There. Oop. Come on. There. Like that. So I get a total of one, two, three. And then this one also, I should point out, this one would also be racemic. So this is also racemic here. So I get a total of one, two, three, four products, okay? So four total products from this reaction. Now you might be thinking, whoa, that's a lot of crazy work, okay? But if you take it step by step, it's very methodical. It's a very methodical process. All you're doing is you're adding HCl 
to one of the pi bonds in a Markovnikov fashion, drawing the two resonance structures and then gives you a nucleophilic attack. And then you just do it to the other side. Okay, that's really all that's happening in here. All right. Um, does anybody notice anything interesting about any of these products? Too racemic. All right. There we go. So why don't we save? Why don't we save this one here, C, for Friday's class, and we'll take a look at it on Friday. Okay. So your job before then is to try that problem. Now let's talk about these two products again, the one two adduct and the one four adduct, and how we might go about, you know, avoiding avoiding all of this. Could I avoid? you know, getting all of these different products, like technically here you have a total of six products, right? Because two of them are racemic. I mean, is it just me? But that doesn't seem very useful. You know, it doesn't seem like a very useful reaction if you're getting six products. I like the kind of reaction where I get one product favored over another. And there is a way to favor the one, two, or the one, four adduct. And it says here that the ratio of these two adducts, one, two, and one, four, is highly dependent on the temperature at which the reaction is run. And so if you take 1,3-butadiene, that's this molecule right here, if you take 1,3-butadiene and you treat it with HBr, if you do the reaction at 0 degrees Celsius, you mostly get the 1,2 adduct. And if you try the reaction at 40 degrees Celsius, you mostly get the 1,4. Now, it's not 100% of either, but it's a lot better than, you know, a 50-50 mixture. And if you're wondering, you know, how do we explain this? You know, how do we explain why you would get the one two at zero degrees Celsius, and why would you get the one four at um, at um, at a higher temperature? Well, the first thing I notice here, and this isn't exactly how the author of the book lays it out, but if you look at these two alkenes, and I just want to remind you that this alkene here, the one two product, is this is a mono substituted alkene, right? If you look at this alkene, it's only got two hydrogens attached to it, so this is a di substituted alkene. And so the one for adduct should be more stable, right? Because the double bond is more substituted. Well, let's keep that in mind as we look at the reaction uh, coordinate diagram here. So it says formation of the one, two adduct forms faster. Okay. The, the rate determining step in both of these, you know, in both of these reactions is the proton transfer. That is the RDS, the rate determining step. The next step, the nucleophilic attack, can either result in the 1-2 or the 1-4. Now, again, the 1-4 is more, is more stable. Okay, it's more stable. But the 1-2 has a lower activation energy, okay, even though it's a little bit less stable. The reason why you end up with the reason why you end up with the 1-2 at cold temperature is because it's based off of what's called the proximity effect, okay? It's just based off, what's off of what's called the proximity effect and the fact that the nucleophile is closer to the carbocation, okay? The carbocation is formed. Whereas when you form the 1,4 adduct, okay? Um, or, or sorry, when you form the 1,2 adduct, since you're doing the reaction at high temperature, it becomes reversible and then you can end up with um sorry when you when you do the reaction at higher temperature then the nucleophilic attack becomes reversible and it, it basically equilibrates to give you the one four adduct as the major product now i'm not going to ask you to draw or a coordinate diagram or anything like that okay all you need to know really for this class is that the one two adduct is going to be formed at cold temperature so zero degrees zero degrees and the one four is going to be formed at 40 degrees or a warmer temperature. I'll just mention this quickly. Um, the difference in energy between the two transition states here, uh, so I had a student ask me that last year and, uh, and he's like, why is there a difference here? Well, the reason the blue one is more stable is because the intermediate is secondary, is a secondary allylic carbocation and here it's a primary allylic carbocation. All right, well, let's move on from there. So it says the 1,4 adduct is going to be more stable because it's a more substituted alkene. So at higher temperatures, the formation of the products is equilibrating. The reaction is going to be under what's called thermodynamic control, and the product that is more stable 
is going to be the major product. So a higher temperature, we always end up with a more stable product and we call that the thermodynamic product. So again, I was trying to explain this to you earlier. A picture is worth a thousand words. And it says that the one, two adduct forms faster due to what's called the proximity effect. And it's really just because you have this molecule, the HBr molecule, right? And when you protonate a carbon one, well, the bromide is going to be closer to this carbocation, right? Because it's right next to where the hydrogen was added, okay? Nothing more than that. So at lower temperatures, the reaction is said to be under kinetic control. The reaction is irreversible, and the product that forms faster will be the major product. So something that we do sometimes is, I'll just back up here quite a bit, is the one, two addict. One, two addict, you'll hear me call that. I'll call that the kinetic product, the kinetic product, because it's formed based on kinetics. And the one, four product, I'll call that the thermo, thermodynamic product. Thermodynamic product, like that. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's take a look at another question here. It says, determine the products for each of the following reactions. In each case, determine which product will predominate. So this is another one where we have to draw some resonance structures and draw some electrophilic attack. Now, remember, the addition of the HBr is going to proceed via Markovnikov addition. So I'm going to get you started on this one. So we're going to draw HBr. This is a symmetrical alkene, right? This line that I've drawn through the middle here shows you that there's a plane of symmetry. And so I want you to start by trying to draw the curved arrows for the Markovnikov addition of HBr across this double bond, okay? Nothing more than curved arrows for Markovnikov addition, something we've looked at probably a hundred times. So give it a shot and see if you can draw the carbocation. And if you can go even further and draw the resonance structure, that's cool too. All right, well, let's see if we can draw that curved arrow. So we're going to get our pair of electrons in our double bond, taking the proton, loss of our leaving group, and we're going to end up with a carbocation. Now let's draw that carbocation. Oops. It should look like this. So here's our carbocation. Could you draw the resonance structure of that carbocation? Yes. Okay, so let's draw the resonance structure. It's an allylic carbocation, so I can delocalize those electrons and I can draw this carbocation as well, where I have the positive charge down here. These are the two resonance structures. Now I'm going to get my bromide attacking. So here's my bromide. Here's bromide. And that nucleophile is going to attack the carbocation. It's going to attack. The carbocation, and I'm going to end up with two products. I'm going to, have to move this, move this a little bit like that. And let's draw the products that we would get. So we would end up with something that looks like this, like this, <clears throat> and we would also end up with this compound. Where we have our two methyl groups and we have our bromine down here like that. Okay, so these would both be formed in racemic mixtures, right? Because this is a chiral carbon here and this is a chiral carbon here. And so you could pencil that in if you wanted to. This would be racemic and this would be racemic. You want to try one more? Do you want to try the other one right now? It's only 8.50. We've got three more hours to go. Give it the old college try. Anybody there? Okay. One person says yes. All right. So let's try it. Let's try the next one. So 
Again, you should be able to draw the curved arrows, and I don't mean this in a mean way, you should be able to draw the curved arrows for a markov nikov addition across a double bond in your sleep. Right? This is something we've looked at for a long time. Okay, so we're going to protonate here like this to make the more stable carbocation. Okay, right? The rich get richer. That's the rule. So we're going to end up with our carbocation here. And we have our other double bond over here. Let's draw the resonance structure. Draw the resonance structure like this. Go. Here's the resonance structure. Boom. Shalak. Like that, and then we have positive charge up here, like this. Okay, so those are my two resonance structures. Now I'm going to get chloride attacking either of those. Draw the mechanism for that as well. So my nucleophile can attack here, or my nucleophile can attack here, and that would give me these products. So I can end up with this. Oops. Some of these bonds are ugly. There we go. So that's going to be racemic. And then this one. I didn't answer all the questions, though, did I? Because it's asking us which one is going to be the major product. OK, well, let's look at the reaction on the top first. So. I guess I should point out that this will be racemic. And then this will be racemic. Okay. Let's look at the two products on the top. I'll circle them in green. I have this product. I'll circle one in green and one in yellow. Who could tell me which one of these would be the major product? Which one would be the major product? The one in green or the one in yellow? Yeah, the one in yellow will be the major product, right? Because it's the one four product. And since I'm doing this reaction at 40 degrees Celsius, okay, the one four product will predominate. Predominate. Okay. And this is the one four product, and this is the one two product. And so the one four product will predominate. This will be major product. The other one will be the minor product. What about the one at the bottom? If I circle this one in blue and if I circle this one in yellow, which one of these would be the major product? Blue or yellow? Yeah, Sean says blue. Anybody else say blue? Blue, blue, blue. Yeah, the blues have it, right? Why? Because this is done at cold temperature. This is done at zero degrees Celsius. And so the Kinetic or the one two product will, will predominate. Okay, so again, this is the major, major product. Like that. Major product. Give me a thumbs up if you think you could do this. I know there's a lot of scratch on one page here, but this is thermodynamics versus kinetics, you know, a real classic in organic chemistry. Anybody think they could do this? All right. Even a happy dance. All right. I'll take that happy dance to the bank. I'm going to cash that in. Get myself some pudding cups or something. All right. Let's see here. Let's switch gears and talk about introduction to pericyclic reactions. Pericyclic reactions are a really neat class of reactions. I actually worked on them in graduate school. My supervisor was kind of hooked on pericyclic reactions. It was like the first thing that he felt that he had discovered, you know, something unique in pericyclic reactions. And so we published a paper, which was a, basically just an organic synthesis, but there was a big, um, there was a big um, pericyclic reaction in it. Anyhow, all right, so let's see here. Pericyclic reactions are really different than anything else that we've looked at in this class, because if you think about it, about 98% of what we look at in this class involves ionic mechanisms. And then in chapter 10 and a couple other times, we talked about free radical mechanisms, very little. But um, pericyclic reactions don't occur with either of those. Okay, And there's three main types of pericyclic reactions. 
The main one that we're going to be interested in is this one here. It's called a cyclo addition. And you can see that here we have a molecule that has two double bonds in it. And so we call that, we call that a diene. Okay. And this one here, you're like, that's just ethylene, man. Well, yeah, we call it the di dienophile because it's looking for a diene. Th these dashed bonds here, they're just representing the new bonds that are formed. But you can see what's happening here is that overall you're losing two pi bonds, right? You had one, two, three, and then you only have one over here. So you lost two pi bonds and you gained two sigma bonds. Look, here you've only got one sigma bond. Sorry, one, two, three, four. And then over here you have a total of six. So you gained two sigma bonds. So something to think about there. And that's summarized on another slide here. The next one is an electrocyclic reaction. We're not really going to focus on these a whole lot. This is called the Cope reaction, named after somebody named Cope. You're like, I can barely cope. Well, Cope discovered this. There's the Cope, then there's the Oxy Cope. There's all kinds of different Cope variations. And then the last one, oops, is this one here. Um, this sigma traffic rearrangement. This is a variation on what's called the, the Claisen rearrangement. Anyhow, and we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at these either. In fact, just to tell you kind of a funny story, my first, so if you've read the entire chapter, chapter 16, there's a lot of stuff in the end that gets into MO theory. And the first semester that I taught at UCCS, the first class they made me teach was this class. This is the first class I've ever taught in, at, at UCCS. And I didn't know, Dr. Anderson, I didn't know that he skipped a bunch of the sections at the end. And I taught the whole thing thinking, you know, my students will want to learn more. I even printed up some handouts from a graduate level textbook thinking, oh, they'll be super excited to learn about this. I learned the hard way that nobody was excited about organic chemistry as I was. Anyhow, so now I'm just, you know, sticking to the, to the meat and potatoes here. Anyhow, pericyclic reactions have four characteristic features. The first one is the reaction mechanism is concerted. What does that mean? It means there's no intermediates. Okay, there's no, you know, interesting intermediates for us to study. The mechanism involves a ring of electrons moving around a closed loop. If you look at this mechanism for any of these, you see how all the curved arrows are all drawn at the same time and they're always going in a circle, right? Look at this. If, and I won't bore you with all of them, but look at this one, look at this one. They all have these, you know, mechanisms where all the curved arrows are pointed at, pushed at once. And if you're wondering, will I have to draw those? Of course, of course. So the transition state is cyclic and the polarity of the solvent generally has no effect on the reaction rate. So you don't have to worry about polar COVID or sorry, polar protic or a polar A protic solvents. This is a summary of just the number of pi and sigma bonds that are broken in uh, and formed in cycloadditions, electrocyclic reactions and sigma tropic rearrangements. Anyhow, with that in mind, let's move on to 16.7. If you go since I own a YouTube channel, I actually get an email today, two emails in my Gmail account from, from YouTube creators. And they're telling me, you know, I have where the, you know, where Mr. Dion, chemistry, this is where you can find your dump trucks of money. Anyhow, um, for my YouTube channel. But sometimes I'll go on my YouTube channel and be like, does anybody look at anything? You know? And the video that I have that has the most views is actually about the Diels Alder reaction. And so, the diels alder reaction is a super useful reaction. It was invented, invented by um, Otto Diels and Kurt Alder. And you can see here that in this reaction, what are you forming? You're forming new carbon-carbon bonds, right? You're forming two new carbon-carbon bonds shown right here. Remember I told you that if you can find a way to make carbon-carbon bonds, you will be famous, okay? So diels alder they're both dead, and they're both still famous, okay? And they won the Nobel Prize, not Nobel Prize, it's got Nobel gases on the brain. They won the Nobel Prize in, I think, 1950. They shared it, and it was for this reaction. So we call this a four plus two cycloaddition. You can probably guess that the four comes from the one, two, three, four um, carbons in the diene system, and then the two comes from the one, two carbons in the dienophile. Anyhow, like all pericyclic reactions, the mechanism is concerted. The curved arrows can be drawn, should be can be drawn clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter. You can see that here they've drawn them clockwise. If you were to draw them counterclockwise, so going like this, one, two, three, like that, that's perfectly acceptable as well. Nobody cares whether you draw the arrows clockwise or counterclockwise. You're like, who really cares? I like the sound of this. Okay. 
So here's the reaction coordinate of the Diels Alder. So again, I would recommend when you're doing the practice problems, always practice pushing your arrows. So double bond move, then I form a new sigma bond like that. All right, you can see that we end up making something that's more stable. Um, and why would that be? Let's see here. It says here that most Diels Alder reactions are thermodynamically favored. Okay, think about it. We're forming sigma bonds, and sigma bonds are more or uh, stronger than than pi bonds. Anyhow, most Diels Alder reactions are thermodynamically favored at low and moderate temperatures. Product stability dominates. Okay, so we make something that's more stable. Good. But this is really interesting. Okay, let's go back here. Okay, we take our diene, right? This is our diene. This is our dienophile. We heat them up, they go over a transition state, and they make something that's more stable. Okay, good enough. You have to heat the reaction up. Great. Okay, sounds good. Everything's good. Well, what it's saying here is if you heat the reaction over 200 degrees Celsius, okay, the reaction actually goes backwards. Like, what? Yes. So let's say you were to heat the reaction at 180 degrees, you'll get the product. And then if you jack the temperature up too high, okay, if you go greater than 200 degrees Celsius, you'll usually get this. This is called the retro Diels Alder. And I'm a victim of the retro Diels Alder. Happened to me many times in life where I, you know, try to, try to get away with doing a reaction too fast, right? Because we teach you in Gen Chem 2 that if you increase the temperature, by 10 degrees, you double the reaction rate. Well, just keep increasing it, increasing it, increasing it. And then all of a sudden, you check your reaction by TLC, which seemed to be going really well. And then all of a sudden, all you have is starting materials. Like, darn it, you know? Why is that? And there's a really good reason why that happens, why you get the retro deals alder. And it goes back to this equation right here. Now, before you give me an eye roll and like, oh, man, I don't want to think about Gibbs free energy. Trust me, I can make this into something very, very simple, okay? So just follow with me, and I promise you'll understand it. So if we think about the enthalpy term, do you guys remember when we calculated delta H way back in organic chemistry one, we said, okay, bonds broken, that requires energy, and then bonds formed, that releases energy. Well, since we break three, three pi bonds, but we form a pi bond and two sigma bonds, remember, that sigma bonds are more stable, right? So that means that overall, you're gonna get a negative delta H, right? So overall, your delta H value is gonna be negative. I'm not gonna ask you to calculate delta H values. I'm just telling you that overall, in the Diels Alder reaction, your enthalpy is gonna be negative. Now, what about the entropy term? Now, you have negative P multiplied by delta S. My change in entropy, I'm going from two molecules, from two molecules, to one molecule. Can anybody tell me, will my delta S be negative or positive when I go from two molecules to one molecule? Is that an increase or a decrease in entropy? Thank you, Sean. It's negative, right? Things are getting more organized. So I take negative delta T and I multiply it by negative delta S. What happens if you take a negative times a negative? You get a positive. So you're taking a negative number. So think about it, you take a negative number and you add a positive number to it, okay? So let's just substitute some numbers in here, do a little algebra. If you take negative two and you add positive one, you still end up with a negative number, okay? And when delta G is negative, it means the reaction is spontaneous. If you took a number like negative two and you added positive 10 to it, well, then you end up with positive eight, right? So that tells you that this reaction depends on what? Because you can't change delta H and you can't change delta S. What can you change? You can change the temperature just by controlling the hot plate. So the more that you jack the temperature up, the more it's going to make your delta G positive. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on what I just told you. Anyone? All right, one person. Cool, I'll take it. So that is explained right here okay it's it's so if you're like oh mr dion i don't like your scratching all over the page well it's summarized even more beautifully right here hey thanks david it is awesome isn't it so it says for a deals auto reaction the enthalpy term has to be larger than entropy in order for the reaction to be favored right in order for us to have a delta a delta g that's negative right at very high temperatures 
the entropy term is just going to dominate, right? It just opposes it. And then you're going to end up with a delta G that's positive, right? It's going to mess your reaction up, okay? So the ideal temperature is usually somewhere between room temperature and 200 degrees Celsius. I, again, when I first started, my first few months in graduate school, I worked on a bunch of um, pericyclic reactions, and I had to do many reactions at 200 degrees Celsius. And we're it's and you think, oh, 200 degrees Celsius, it's only double the boiling point of water. It can't be that difficult to attain. Well, to do organic chemistry in your regular everyday glassware um, at 200 degrees Celsius, it's actually not that easy. You have to find creative ways I use things like oil baths, and then the, those usually boil. You don't like to leave them overnight because they're dangerous. So then I tried melting wax. So wax is a very low vapor pressure, but then sometimes the wax would even burn. Then, oh man, you should have seen it. It was like rubbing two sticks together back in the back in the 90s. We even took a microwave from like uh, Walmart and just drilled a hole on the top of it and shoved a piece of glass in it. Do not try this at home, people. Okay, I highly recommend against that, but it was something I tried. I was like, and my supervisor was like, how much is the microwave? I was like, I don't know, $60. He's like, yeah, go buy one. And I literally took a drill. I bored it from facilities, just <laughs> drilled a hole in it and stuck a tube in it and cranked up the temperature to see what would happen. Very, very crazy stuff. Anyhow, um, yeah, all right, enough about that. All right, so Diels auto reaction says the reaction, the reactants again at a diene and the dienophile, as one of my students once put it to me in the lab. I am diene, you know, in organic chemistry. The dienophile and the diene, I mean, Diels auto chemistry, it's it's a it's a big topic. I mean, there are books written about Diels auto chemistry. And so we could spend a lot of time talking about Diels auto chemistry, but our book. He really tries to distill it into the simplest possible bit. So follow me here for the last few minutes of this lecture. Okay, and I promise it will be abundantly clear. It says your dienophile needs to possess an electron withdrawing group. Oftentimes in organic chemistry, we abbreviate electron withdrawing group as EWG. Okay, so that means the dienophile needs to have some kind of electron withdrawing group. So we could say it's got an electron withdrawing group on it. Um, or the reaction is re going to require a high temperature, which does not favor the product. So usually deals auto reactions. You have to choose your reagents very carefully. It's like anything in organic chemistry. You can't just do everything you want because molecules are going to do what they want to do. It says when an electron withdrawing group is attached to the dienophile, the reaction is generally spontaneous. Why is this aldehyde? Why, right? Why is this carbonyl? Why is a ketone? Why is an ester? An ester? Why is a carboxylic acid? Why is a nitrile? Why are these all electron withdrawing groups, okay? Right, these are the electron withdrawing groups all highlighted in red. The answer is because if you were to draw this dienophile uh, with your carbonyl like this, right, think about it. You can draw the resonance arrows like this, okay? Where you show this resonance structure where you have right, the negative charge delocalized up on the oxygen like this, and then you have a positive charge down here like that okay so you could do that for any one of these here in fact in the in the textbook if you read david klein's textbook he even says something like could you draw the resonance structures for each one of these and show why it's delta plus down here at all of these carbons like this and show why it's delta minus here delta minus here delta minus here right delta minus uh, here okay so you should be able to do that just like I did right here for the aldehyde. Okay. Another thing about Diels alder reactions is that they're stereospecific depending on whether you're starting with an E or a Z dienophile. If you start with an E, sorry, if you start with a Z dienophile, this is Z, you're going to end up with your two groups from your dienophile being cis to each other. If you start with an E, Dienophile, you're going to start with your two groups, or you're going to end up with your two groups being trans to one another like that. You can also use an alkyne as a dienophile, and you can practice drawing the curved arrows to prove that, right? You could draw your curved arrows like this, okay? And then you end up with this diene system in a six-membered ring like that. And so 
I want you to remember that dienes can exist in the S cis or the S trans conformation, right? Here again. Maybe that's somebody trying to tell me something. Yeah, so in order for a Diels Elder reaction to occur with a diene, it has to be in the S cis confirmation. It's got to be in that confirmation or it's not going to work. OK, now with that in mind, if you take a look at this diene right here, this is not going to react. Why? Because this is locked, right? It's trapped or locked in the S trans confirmation. OK. If you look at this molecule here, cyclobentadiene, you can clearly see that the diene is locked in the S cis conformation. So this is very reactive, okay? Very reactive. All right. So it's 9-11. Next class, very simple. What I want you to do before lecture on Friday is finish reading, or I want you to read section 16.7. If you haven't read it already, make sure to read the Deals Alder section. I'm literally asking you to read one thing, okay? One thing, one part of a chapter. It's probably 10 minutes. Everybody's got 10 minutes. So I want you to read section 16.7. You don't have to worry about 16.8. You don't have to worry about 16.9. You don't have to worry about 16.10. You don't have to worry about 16.11, and you don't have to worry about 16.12 or 16.13. So we're ending at 16.7. So the section that we're on right now is the last section that we're going to cover. So what I want to do on Friday is I want to spend probably the first 45 minutes talking about diels alder chemistry the whole time. And then in the end, we'll go back and solve that problem about 1.4 and 1.2 addition that we didn't finish. And if there's any time left over, we'll tackle any practice problems that you want to look at. But again, I highly recommend or I implore you to read section 16.7 before coming to class on Friday. It'll make it much more enjoyable and much easier moving forward. All right. It's 9.13. Are there any questions about anything? Yes, sir. I have a quick question. Go. So uh, for the first part with the uh, with the dienes, um, since we get four products, just just a, a question about the real world, you know, um, I know that you can end up sometimes with percentage percentages of how many products you get. Yep. Uh, but that seems a little useless if you're aiming to get one particular product Absolutely. in the real world. So how yeah. would you uh, separate them? Um, well, usually, so the examples that we look at, David, are really just, you know, specific examples that are chosen for somebody who's learning the subject. If you had this kind of situation where you're looking to make a 1-2 or a 1-4 addict, usually um, it's going to be in a situation where one of them is going to be more favored than the other based on stability, right? Because in natural products, for example, the double bond would usually be in a ring, you know, or one of the bonds would be inside a ring somehow. But outside of that, there are ways that you can, you know, using different things like controlling, using temperature, other things that we don't even get into in this class, like Lewis acids can be used um, to, to mitigate products or to, you know, preferentially form one product over another. So there's a whole plethora of ways that you can do that. But yeah, it's, it's case specific, you know, 